Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Emerald Eshbor University. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University, and along with my EAB University colleagues, Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University, and Amy Stone from Ohio State University Extension, we welcome you to our today's presentation entitled Gypsy Moth, Everything You Need to Know in a Half an Hour, presented by EAB University's own Elizabeth Barnes. Elizabeth is the exotic forest pest educator with the Department of Entomology at Purdue University. She received her doctorate in ecology from the University of Denver, where she specialized in plant insect interactions and studied tent caterpillars and fall webworms. She currently works on science communications and invasive species outreach at Purdue. We welcome your comments and questions today, so please feel free to type them in the chat pod or the Q&A pod. Elizabeth will be answering them right after this presentation. Tomorrow, you will be emailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include our presenter's contact information, as well as information on how to obtain CEUs for viewing this live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today. And Elizabeth, please unmute your mic and you can begin your presentation. Thank you, Robin. Uh, before we get started, I did want to mention that today's presentation, as well as the upcoming series of talks that we're doing, are um, sort of a, a new way of doing it for us. Um, we are doing these shorter half an hour sessions um, with uh, time for questions at the end. And um, we are also pre-recording the talks. Um, so the question and answers will be live. The talks are pre-recorded and we will be showing the video of that here. Uh, we're doing it that way just because uh, we realized we wanted to do this set of six talks focusing in on each of these invasive insects. Um, but we were having some trouble getting the, the scheduling to work for um, all three of us. So me, Cliff, and uh, Carrie Tauscher of the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Um, so we decided to try recording them and um, hopefully it'll go smoothly today. And when you fill out the survey, we'd love to hear back from you if you like this format, if you think we should change it, just so that we can get an idea of what to present to you in the future. And uh, with that, I will start the talk. Here you go. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, everything you need to know about Gypsy Moth in half an hour. I'll start out by the presentation by talking to you about uh, Gypsy Moth, the insect. And then at the end, Carrie Tauscher will tell you about how to identify Gypsy Moth's host plants. So I took this picture several years ago in uh, Northern Indiana in the middle of the summer. Uh, if you look around, you can see the grass is green, the other trees are green, but these trees have lost all of their leaves. Um, so what we want to tell you today is how to stop this from happening to your trees, or if it does happen, whether or not you really need to worry about mortality. First, I'm gonna give you a quick 30 second summary of what you need to know about gypsy moths. They are an invasive leaf eating caterpillar from Europe. They prefer oaks, but they are generalists. So if they run out of oak, they'll move on to something else. And when they defoliate trees, most of the time healthy deciduous trees will be okay. They will usually recover. However, if they have been stressed either before or after they've been defoliated, or if they are defoliated two years in a row, that's when we often start to see mortality. Evergreens are at especially high risk of this. Evergreens store their nutrients in a different way than deciduous trees. So if an evergreen is defoliated, usually we, uh, we see a pretty high risk of mortality. So most often those trees die. 
Management of Gypsy Moth is going to depend on the area that you're in, and I will get into some details on that later, um, but it's more about whether you are in a newly invaded area or an area that already has an established Gypsy Moth population. Within those different areas, there are a range of management options that can be done either at a large scale with a community doing the management or at a small scale in a single yard. All right, but what actually are they are? What do they look like? Where did they come from? Now we're gonna get into the details. So there are actually two species of uh, gypsy moth that are of concern. There's the European gypsy moth and the Asian gypsy moth. We're gonna to focus today on the European gypsy moth because um, it's already been found in the areas where we're located in Indiana. The European gypsy moth was first introduced into Massachusetts in 1869, and it is now found throughout the Northeast down to Virginia and through the Midwest up to Michigan and Wisconsin. The first gypsy moth in Indiana was found in 1973. The gypsy moth life cycle starts in the spring when the caterpillars hatch out. Often this is around April 23rd, but it's going to vary depending on the temperature. They are caterpillars for about 40 days, then they will pupate in mid-June, and they will be pupa for around 10 to 14 days. Then they emerge as adults and are flying around from July to August, and they will lay their eggs from July to August, and those eggs will then overwinter. We will get into the gypsy moth ID now, but I wanted to start out by saying, don't worry about IDing the pupa or the adults, unless you're someone who either as your hobby or professionally works with insects, there's a good chance that you'll have a hard time distinguishing these from some of our native moths. And we don't want our native moths to come to harm because they've been confused with a gypsy moth. The egg masses are a little bit easier to recognize. Uh, as you can see here, they are kind of a rusty pale brown color and they are just covered in little tiny hairs. They can be found just about anywhere, houses, tires, trailers. Um, I've, I've seen them on just about anything outside that you can think of. In outbreaks, they'll often be seen in clusters as well. So you can see over on the side of the screen now, there's a whole bunch of individual uh, clusters of eggs all in a group together. And this is just because there's so many gypsy moths that they end up laying eggs pretty close to each other. So again, if you see these rusty um, to pale brown, furry little sort of like mounds or splotches plastered to the side of something outside, you might have found gypsy moth egg masses. The caterpillars are quite distinctive. They've got this blue black body and they have hair sticking out all over the place. They've also got kind of a yellowish head and they have these very distinctive blue and red bumps along their body. You'll notice the first four pairs of bumps are blue and then the rest of them are red. Um, and so they, they are really striking and they stand out from other native caterpillars. However, people will still sometimes get them confused with other native caterpillars. Uh, the first thing to remember is that gypsy moths do not have spines, they have hairs. If they have spines, there's a good chance that you found a morning cloak caterpillar, which is this lovely, beautiful butterfly uh, that people often like to see. But since it has spines, which people can confuse with the hairs, and it's kind of black colored, and it's got those red spots, sometimes they do get mixed up. So remember, if they have spines, it's not a gypsy moth. If they build any sort of tent or web, they are also not a gypsy moth. There's a good chance you've encountered either tent caterpillars or fall webworms. Now, these caterpillars can also be somewhat destructive, but they are native, and we typically see them having these sort of cycling up and down populations where most of the time they're at pretty low levels and aren't causing a lot of damage, and then occasionally we have outbreaks. So if they are spinning some sort of tent or web, not a gypsy moth. If they have white spots or stripes, again, they are not gypsy moths. Um, these caterpillars are most likely tent caterpillars again, although there are some other caterpillars that have similar sort of patterns on the back that can be confused with gypsy moths. 
And finally, if they're emerging in late summer or fall as caterpillars, they are not gypsy moss. I'm showing some fall webworms over here, but there's also a wide range of other caterpillars that like to hang out in groups that sometimes people get confused with gypsy moss and they get worried that it's like a, a second outbreak of gypsy moss that summer. Gypsy moss are in the spring, other caterpillars are in the late summer and fall. All right. So what kind of damage do these insects actually do? Well, one thing they do is they are incredibly messy eaters. This is a picture from under a tree infested with gypsy moss, and you can see they've wasted a ton of the leaves that they should be eating. You can also see little black bits on the ground. That is the caterpillar frass or poop. Uh, sometimes people who are in areas with a heavy gypsy moth outbreak will say that it kind of sounds like there's a light rain. That light rain is actually caterpillar poop. When you kill gypsy moths, often their bodies will all fall down to the base of the tree that they were on. Um, on one hand, this is good because you've dealt with your gypsy moth problem. And on the other hand, you now have hundreds of dead rotting caterpillars under your tree. So this is another downside is that their bodies will decay and their bodies smell awful when they decay. But here is the thing that I bet most of you are concerned about, which is the defoliation that they cause. Um, so they have some preferences. They really, really like oak trees, but particularly white oaks. But if those aren't around, they will eat other things. For example, maple, hickory, witch hazel, pine, or spruce. Um, but they don't like ash trees, tulip trees, black locust, or walnut, as well as some other trees. So the ash trees finally get a break. And later on in the talk, again, Carrie will go over how to identify these trees with you. The ways that trees respond to defoliation is also going to vary by a lot of different factors. Uh, deciduous trees, if they are healthy and if they stay healthy after a defoliation event, then there's a good chance that they'll be okay. However, if the deciduous tree was either distressed before or after the defoliation event, or if they're defoliated two years in a row, that's when we really start to worry and get concerned about the health of that tree. And that's when you can see uh, losing limbs or the tree getting sickly and more susceptible to other things coming in and killing it or having the tree generally just die. Uh, for evergreen trees, it's even worse. For evergreens, a single year of defoliation is often enough to kill them. Uh, this is because they store a lot of their reserves in their needles. And so if you lose those needles, then the tree doesn't really have anything to fall back on. They've invested so much energy in those needles that they can't really recover from their loss. Being able to predict gypsy moth outbreaks is really also very important for making your treatment plans. Um, there is actually a fungus that helps keep gypsy moth populations in check, but its effectiveness is weather dependent. So when it rains more, um, the fungus does really well, and we typically see uh, fewer gypsy moths as a result. However, if there's a drought, the fungus usually kills fewer gypsy moths, and so we see more caterpillars, and then they're able to lay more eggs. Um, I also wanted to mention that the National Phenology Network has a uh, really, really helpful map where you can see predictions about gypsy moth emergence and get updates from them as well. All right, so next we're going to talk about where these caterpillars actually are right now to kind of give you an idea if you should be worried or how much you should be keeping your eye out for them. So although this map is from 2019, it's still pretty current. So a few counties have been added, but uh, for the most part, this is the distribution of gypsy moths. They go from Maine all the way down to Virginia, and then at a diagonal up through Michigan and Wisconsin. When we're thinking about the different gypsy moth populations, we like to break it up into three different categories of areas. 
The generally infested areas have established widespread populations of gypsy moss. The transitional areas are areas where there are some established populations, but it's kind of on the borderline. So some gypsy moss might sneak over, but for the most part, those areas are uninfested. And the white sections are the currently uninfested areas, so they do not have established populations of gypsy moth. We have different management goals depending on which category of uh, infestation a particular area falls into. We eradicate gypsy moss in the uninfested area. So we're really trying to stop them from spreading any further by going in and killing all of the gypsy moss in a given population. We try to slow the spread of gypsy moss in those in-between areas that are um, infested, but they're kind of at the borderline. So there's still a chance that we can uh, kind of control them and stop them from spreading further. So we'll treat new populations as they come up there. And then finally, uh, in the more generally infested areas, the goal is less about eradicating them and more about trying to protect particularly vulnerable areas and particularly important trees. For example, if there was a historically important oak tree in an area that you wanted to be absolutely sure um, wouldn't be killed by gypsy moths, you might target that tree and protect it. Or if there was a big area of oaks that you know had recently um, experienced a drought, you might also want to try and protect that area from gypsy moth. Which brings us to what you can actually do to treat these insects. First, there are several ground treatment methods that homeowners can do themselves. Uh, for the egg masses, you can manually scrape those egg masses off of wherever you find them, then take the eggs and either put them in soapy water or you can freeze them. Either method works fine. Just make sure you leave them for a while in both so that they are um, actually killed. Uh, you can also treat them with various spray oils. Just make sure that they are labeled for gypsy moth and that you're following um, all of the uh, instructions on the label when you do that. Uh, you can also uh, band your trees for gypsy moths and you do this by uh, wrapping a piece of burlap around a tree, tying it in the middle and then folding the top part over. Then when the gypsy moths crawl up the tree, they will get stuck in that burlap bag. And then the next day you can just go over, you can pull it off, you can take off all the gypsy moss and throw them again, either in a bucket of soapy water, or you can put them in a container and freeze them. Both method methods will kill the gypsy moss. There are also some um, professional ground treatment methods for the caterpillars, including using a hydraulic sprayer or tree injection, uh, which injects insecticide into the tree and uh, again, will um, go up through the tree into the leaves and then the caterpillars will eat the leaves and that will kill them. Aerial treatments are also an option for gypsy moths. For the caterpillars, you can use a wide range of things like BTK, uh, mating disruption, or um, gyp check, and also um, mimic, which is a growth regulator. So all of these are really well tested, um, widely used ways of treating for gypsy moth caterpillars. It's also important to consider timing when you're planning your treatment. For eggs, you can scrape or spray anytime from when they first are laid through hatch in late April. Um, for uh, things like banding and caterpillars and caterpillar insecticides, you want to plan on doing that as soon as you notice the caterpillars, really the sooner the better, um, because unfortunately most people don't notice the caterpillars until they're quite large. And then for aerial spraying, you want to start planning anytime after eggs are um, first laid all the way through April the next year. And then usually the best time to aim for aerial spraying is the second week of May or kind of think about it around Mother's Day. It's also really important to make sure that you get organized. So talk to either your neighbors or the neighboring landowners. Um, this will increase the effectiveness. Uh, think about it. I mean, caterpillars are really mobile. And if you treat a tree, one tree, and then right next to it is a tree that's covered in caterpillars, well, those caterpillars will move from one tree to another. 
It also avoids doubling efforts. It can save money. Uh, often if you get a big group together, that will reduce the cost of treating the trees and will give you more treatment options. The main takeaway is don't panic, get organized. Now we're going to move into the host plant identification portion of the talk. Initially, Carrie Tauscher was going to give this section, um, but I'm going to be presenting it today. Um, there were some unforeseen circumstances so that Carrie couldn't be with us for this, um, but she did provide the base of the rest of the PowerPoint and a lot of the recommendations for the ID traits. So full credit goes to her for that. I am basically just presenting you with the information that she provided to me. There are a wide range of uh, hosts that gypsy moss will feed on, but we're going to focus on this list of host plants today. So the oaks, apples, hawthorn, sweet gum, basswood, poplar, as well as aspen and cottonwood, willow, and birch. We're going to uh, start out with some just basic information about tree ID. Uh, the first trait that I wanted to uh, go over with you is alternate and opposite branching. Alternate branching is when the branches alternate along the tree. Uh, you can get a feel for this if you stick your left arm up in the air and your right leg out. So they're um, separated and they're um, alternating along your body. Uh, opposite branching is when the branches come out from the trunk and they are opposite one another. Um, and you can get a feel for this if you hold both your arms up in the air and um, there the uh, arms sticking out are opposite each other on your body. So it's symmetrical basically. The other important piece of information is simple versus compound leaves. You can get an idea if a tree has simpler compound leaves by looking at where it attaches to the tree. So a simple leaf is just going to have one leaflet. So that's kind of one of those typical leaf shapes. Whereas a compound leaf is going to attach at a branch and then it almost, it has this vein sort of stem that goes out and it has a bunch of smaller leaflets that then attach to that section. But still the whole thing makes up a leaf. So if you look at these examples here, the parts in green, that is a single leaf, even though it looks like the one, the first one has one leaf and the second one has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five leaves, both of them are a single leaf. Now we're gonna move into the ID portion uh, and we're gonna start out with red oaks. So some identification information for oaks in general are they have simple leaves, they are alternate leaves, and typically oaks have clusters of buds at the end of the twig, often five or more. Uh, oaks are also almost always lobed, and in the red oaks, they have sort of these little points at the end of each lobe, so little little like spiky bristles. In the, uh, the fruit of the oak tree, so the acorn, um, the red oaks typically have sort of um, short and wide acorns that are clustered kind of in the middle of the branch, and they have flat scaly caps. Um, although, as you can see from the acorns pictured here, they are not always actually short and wide. There's some variation. Uh, oaks are notoriously difficult to um, sort of tell the difference between red oaks and white oaks because they like to hybridize so much. White oaks, in general, um, again, have simple alternate leaves with clustering buds at the tip. They are again lobed, but this time the lobes are more rounded and they are almost always very smooth at the tips of those lobes. The acorns are usually a bit longer and thinner um, and they usually cluster at the tips of the branch. The caps on these acorns are usually um, sort of bumpy instead of the smooth scaly caps that we saw on the red oaks. The next host plant is the apples and crab apples. Uh, apples have simple alternate leaves that are usually about two to four inches long. Although again, as with all plants and really all organisms, there's a great variety, a wide range of variation. Um, the leaves are, are usually kind of generally oval shaped but with like lightly pointed at the end. Um, they are serrated along the edge, which you can see pretty clearly here on this 
leaf. Uh, you can see those little pointy little saw teeth at the edge. And the flowers have five petals, uh, you know, except of course when the wind has blown some of them off, but typically they have five petals. Another host plant of gypsy moth are the hawthorns. Um, we have a very typical example of an ornamental hawthorn and the top image here. Um, you can see that sort of standard wide, almost flat uh, shape to the top of the tree. They also have red fruits that are uh, very bright and kind of eye-catching. They often have thorns, like the name would suggest, but they do not always have thorns, so that's not a trait that you can count on. They flower in the spring, and unfortunately, the leaf shapes vary widely between species. You can kind of get a sense of that here in the two examples where you can see the leaves up close. They look very different. Um, so unfortunately, that's an also not a great ID trait for hawthorns. The next species that gypsy moths feed on are the sweet gums. Um, they are just starting to leaf out here in Indiana right now in late April. Um, they also have these very, very distinctive kind of pointy balls that uh, often fall to the ground and are, uh, you know, I have tripped over them a few times personally, but I also think they're very kind of a, a really neat, fun shape. So um, I enjoy them even if they make me trip. Um, anyway, they also have sort of this deep, craggy, distinctive bark. Um, and in the fall, the foliage is this beautiful red color. So that's also quite eye-catching. The uh, leaf shapes are star-shaped. Um, they have very distinctive lobes. So they're deeply lobed um, with these pointed tips and they have very fine serration on the edges. Um, and, and so again, um, once you kind of get a sense of what a sweet gum looks like, they're hard to miss because they have so many different, um, very obvious, very distinctive traits to them. The next kind of group of trees that we're looking at are the poplars, aspens, and cottonwood. Um, gypsy moss uh, don't prefer these trees, but they will feed on them and they will certainly lay their eggs on them. Uh, they have uh, a sort of a small white fuzzy seeds. The seeds are really tiny and they've got that fuzz around them. So when you see that fuzz floating in the air, uh, you can usually blame uh, some sort of poplar. Uh, the, the best way to really recognize these um, trees is by the, uh, the leaf petiole. So if, you, if you're able to get your hands on a leaf, you can kind of try and roll it between your fingers. And if it's difficult to roll between your fingers, that means it's probably uh, some kind of poplar aspen cottonwood. Uh, this is, if you've ever seen a quaking aspen and it sort of looks like it's like shaking or shivering back and forth, that's what causes it. It, it causes um, the wind to move them back and forth in that way. They also often have a kind of triangular shape to the leaves with these kind of lightly toothed, smooth toothed edges, um, but that's not always a guaranteed trait and there are other plant species that can, um, can have those. So I wouldn't rely on that trait. I would instead do your best to try and get a leaf in hand and, and see if that petiole is flat. Next, we have the basswood, and a sort of easy way to uh, remember how to recognize a basswood is you can think of the shape of the leaf is the same of the shape of the tree. They also have um, this kind of oblique leaf base. If you look at the picture here, you can see it kind of swoops down at the bottom. Um, so it's not, if you were to fold it in half, it wouldn't be symmetrical, even if the leaf was perfectly healthy and a perfect um, leaf formed leaf. They also, turn that off, there we go. Um, they also have this um, nutlet, so these, these little kind of fruits on the tree that have a helicopter top. And if you can get your hands on one of those, that's also a great indication that you've got a basswood. In Indiana, they bloom from around June to July, and they have this really lovely sweet smell to their blooms. So that's another thing that you can um, recognize and pick up on pretty easily. Now we have the last of the gypsy moth host plants that we're going to be highlighting for you today. Uh, this is the willow. 
their leaves have this long, thin shape. They almost look like um, a kind of typical leaf shape that's been stretched way out. They have serrated margins, so they've got those little saw teeth at the leaf edges. Um, they also have a single prominent mid vein, and you can see that really clearly in this picture here. That's a really distinctive mid vein. The buds on the willow trees are also um, pretty, pretty obvious and easily recognizable. They are usually uh, held with a single or three uh, bud scales to the twigs, and they're held really, really tightly to the twig. Like if you if you look at that twig over on the side there and look at that bug, it is pressed right up against it. Um, gypsy moss are very, uh, their egg masses are very commonly found on weeping willow, um, which is one of the, uh, one of the kind of common uh, ornamental willows that we often will see. So um, just again, as a reminder for gypsy moth host plants, uh, the caterpillars will prefer oak, but particularly white oak. They will also eat a wide range of other trees, including willow, sweet gum, poplar, apple, and pine. And they do not like to eat ash, tulip trees, black locusts, and walnuts. So to wrap up, I really want to encourage all of you to report invasive species if you see them. Um, gypsy moth is already established in some areas, but we still want to know where it's popping up each year so we can kind of keep track of where it is, if there are outbreaks, things like that. Um, in addition, there are areas that don't have gypsy moth yet, and we really want to know where those locations are so that we can swoop right in and eradicate them before they're able to establish a population and spread even further. There are a wide range of ways you can report invasive species. Uh, first up is the EDMAPS website, that's eddmaps.org. Um, this website allows you to upload photos and locations of invasive species sightings, as well as any other information that you'd like to uh, provide. And then that information is reviewed by experts who can confirm whether it's an invasive species or not. There's also an associated app, the Great Lakes EDN app. Please search for it exactly like that, or you can Google it and um, you can just click through the, the link on the website to the app store. If you search for it a little bit wrong, it pulls up a bank app instead, uh, which is you know not good for reporting invasive species. Um, but that's also a great way to uh, report invasive species because it allows you to do it while you're outside, just walking around. It allows you to do it in the moment. Uh, there's also a website that you, or excuse me, a phone number you can call 1-866-663-9684. Um, and again, that will allow you to report the sighting of an invasive species. Um, there, that one is more about new sightings of invasive species rather than um, species in already established areas, um, but it's also a good number to call to report. And then finally, Purdue has an invasive species website, reportinvasive.com. Uh, and this site walks you through all these options. Again, um, if you search for Purdue invasive species, usually it's one of the first things that pops up. So if you, um, if you would prefer to have kind of a summary, that's a great place to go. We also have uh, information about other invasive species there as well. And you can also email us. I always say, if all else fails, um, search for someone who works on invasive species, get in touch with them. And even if they're not the right person to report to, um, they should know someone who is and um, send the information along to the right person. We all talk to each other. When you do submit a report, uh, there are some important things that can really help us um, uh, deal with a sighting of an invasive species and confirm that it is that organism. First off, uh, write down where you are so that we can go back and check the area. Uh, also take a picture. Pictures are incredibly valuable for us because it lets us uh, determine if you uh, saw the invasive species itself or one of the lookalikes. And uh, if you can, and if you want to, you can also collect a sample uh, with insects. You can do this by uh, just getting, say, a little water bottle that you might have with you, 
uh, scooping it up, closing the lid, bringing it home and sticking it in the freezer. That's a way, great way to collect it. Um, they're uh, basically any sort of container that you might have. The big thing is that you don't want it to get crushed. So yes, you could throw it in a Ziploc bag, um, but be really careful that you don't crush it on the way back home. And I also wanted to let you know, we've got several more of these webinars coming up. We have spotted lanternfly, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, thousand cankers disease, and hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, we hope you'll join us for those. And um, we are slightly over the promised 30 minutes. Sorry about that. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those now. Uh, all of our contact information is on the screen right now, and we are always happy to answer questions after the fact if you think of them later. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we have had quite an interesting chat going on. I don't know if you've seen this, but um, the um, a lot of it was talking about how to get rid of those fallen gypsy moths. Um, let's yes. see. Okay. Yes, I've, I've seen some of the chat. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think it's a great point that um, freezing can be tricky depending on where you are. If they're a little bit more cold hardy, they might need to be frozen for a longer period of time. Um, you can kill gypsy moth eggs in the freezer, but you have to leave them there for quite a while. So with eggs, I mean, I, I the freezer is an option, but I would recommend either soapy water or you can also put them in rubbing alcohol if you don't have too many of them, as long as they're completely covered, that will kill them. Uh, with caterpillars though, you can definitely kill them by freezing them. So um, the caterpillars are very easily killed with cold. You just need to, you know, leave them in there long enough that the little caterpillar bodies are hard. Okay, I know that Cliff has has a very kindly um, answered one of the questions. Um, and it was and in, in case some of you had have not seen the question, it says why were they these why were gypsy moths moth introduced? Mm -hmm. And it, Cliff said they were brought into Medford, um, Massachusetts, by an amateur entomologist, Etienne Leopold, in the 1860s. He wanted to breed them with native silk moths to make an insect that would turn oak leaves into silk. The project failed. Go figure, gypsy moths escaped and infested the local area. The infestation spread slowly because females cannot fly. Spread followed the development of automobiles and the transit system. These insects are great hitchhikers. Yes. Yes, this is gypsy moth um, is an exception in the insect world, mostly with invasive insects. Um, usually they're accidentally introduced. So like I, I've got a picture of an Asian longhorn beetle on the screen right now. That's it accidentally introduced. Same with emerald ash borer and things like that. Gypsy moth, just as Cliff said, it was someone who brought them over on purpose and they escaped. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have such strict rules about what types of insects you're allowed to report because, you know, once they get out, it can be really hard to contain again. Okay, um, there, I'm going to answer this one question here. Um, is there any way that we could get a copy of the recorded presentation? Um, there, this is being recorded, just want to let you know, and it will be available on the emeraldashboard.info website on the EAB University page. And that information will should be on the um, that page here within the next couple of days. All right, and the, the only, only other question here is any tips on identifying adults? Oh, so adults are very tricky to identify. Um, I so if if you're somebody who is really interested in, in identifying adults, I would say um, shoot me an email. My email's on the screen, and I can send you some really good keys for keying out adult gypsy moths. Um, they just they I, I'm I'm hesitant to give any tips right now just because they're so easy to get mixed up with native moths as adults and I don't want somebody 
getting them mixed up. But, but like I said, if that's something that you want to do, just shoot me an email um, and I will provide you with that information. Okay. Um, Mary says, to be fair, that entomologist did report the escape of the gypsy moths and requested that they be sprayed. The government ignored that problem, and we all know how that turned out. <clears throat> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, what a mess. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, things going on in the 1860s, you know, mm -hmm. should have mm -hmm. been there, I guess, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. Um, thank you for participating today everyone and uh, make sure to come back tomorrow when we do the spotted lanternfly and I want to thank everyone and I will let everyone go now and close down the meeting.